and welcome to the Victory Garden. Today, Jim Wilson visits a beautiful garden in Carlisle, Massachusetts, where all the family work together to grow herbs and to make wreaths, sachets, and potpourri. Meanwhile, Roger Swain has set up headquarters in the raspberry patch, and he says the picking is mighty good. Now, what Roger doesn't eat out of hand will, I hope, find their way to Marion in the kitchen for her recipe of the day. All that and more is coming right up, so don't go away. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television stations and by Monrovia Nursery Company, major producer of container-grown plants, supplying garden centers and nurseries nationwide. By the American Rental Association, 3,500 members nationwide, renting tools and equipment for home, gardening, and entertaining needs. And by W.R. Grace, makers of Peter's professional concentrated liquid plant food for all home gardening needs, indoors and out. Recently, Jim Wilson was in town. And because he loves herbs so much, we sent him over to Carlisle to check out a remarkable herb garden. This is really a family affair, as Jim found out while being shown around by Maureen Rutgers. Let's have a look. Maureen, this is a beautiful oh, garden. And an old ladder laid here on the ground. Yeah, Mike and I found it in the barn, and we just decided to use it to separate the culinary herbs. And it was a teaching garden for the children. So you just laid it flat on the right. ground and filled it up with right. potting soil and put um, mm -hmm. one herb per rung. Mm -hmm. Like this is the lemon thyme, and so we'd you know, ask the children to go find the lemon thyme. And we'd... that was how they really learned, and it was nice for us, and it's close to the kitchen. So That's it worked a out nicely. Idea. And then I can tell I'm in New England you with can, all this yeah. stonework. We've broken our backs a few times, I'll tell you, on moving them. This was an old um, wall that was here, a very old house, and so that was nice to have. And then we had the old wall here, which was and you great. And got, you got some plants here with all sorts of potential mm -hmm. for um, drying and decoration. What's this one? You know, while I'm touring with you, I'm going to cut because I, my life is busy, so I'm going to have to keep working. So this is lamb's ear. Lambsier. And this we put in the drying shed, which we have over there. And we dry that for the herb wreaths or for arrangements. Oh, Tori. Well, now, these then, are not herbs over here. That's some of the well, finest delphinium I've seen. That's right. But, you know, anything that I can dry, I kind of consider that is partly an herb that I can use. And this Look at is this. the ribbon grass that, and the delphinium. That Sometimes I will take this and make like a little ribbon, and I will tie them up and make a little bow. How you can clever. do all sorts of decorations with ribbon grass. And then I love to incorporate it with delphinium. With delphinium. And look right. at the size of these spikes. Isn't that beautiful? Should we cut one of them? Oh, it seems a shame, but go ahead. Well, I'm going to cut a few because these dry beautifully, and I strip the leaves, and I put that back to the earth. And then we use these, and we put them in the barn. Beautiful color, isn't it? Oh, marvelous. And this is my kind of my long herb garden that uh, I just have specimen herbs in. And uh, I have had times weaving through that. So you, you mix your herbs and your perennials, your ornamental perennials, mm -hmm. along with them. It's hard to tell which is right. which some well, of the herbs are Well, most of so these beautiful. are herbs. Of course, a salvia is an herb. This is salvia superba. And this is my favorite, which is ladies' mantle. This is salvia superba right mm -hmm. here. Almost gone by, but I get things at different colors. So I'm going to cut some of this because... So even in the seed pod stage, right. still Right, the seed have. pod is still very good to dry. Uh-huh. So that'll go nice with the delphinium. And this is my favorite, Jim. You know why? Because of the dew drops. See the ladies' mantle? And after rain or... Ladies I Mantle, well, you can see why it's named that way from the little cleft that's right, right in here, like a cape. Yes, isn't that beautiful? Now, this I do in different gradations, and sometimes I'll leave some of them and, and it'll be a little bit beige to brown, and I'll dry those. Look at with the delphinium. Isn't that pretty? Mm -hmm. And then I have beautiful rosemary for remembrance. Can you smell that? Does that smell good? Oh, it's more like resin, like pine. And that dries beautifully. And then I have a lot of yarrow down there, which we'll walk down here and we'll walk uh, to the path. This and garden, all this lavender. This garden has all sorts of vistas, the way you have it laid out with these beautiful uh, Well, it was originally walks. for teaching with the children, but all the lavender here. Well, let, let, me, let me snip some lavender. Some that lavender. My favorite place. lavender, Jim, is Hidcoat. This is Jean Davis, which is a pink lavender. Now, hang on a minute. I don't is, know these varieties. This is... Well, this is, this is lavender vera. 
But this is Jean Davis, which is a and pink This is Jean Davis, a lavender. pink one. And pink. this is... But this is my favorite. This is this Hidcoat is that you Hidcoat. would see at Hidcoat in England. Rosemary Veery has beautiful Hidcoat. Okay. Um, but this is wonderful. See how much darker it is? See how lovely oh, that is? Oh, boy. Yeah, nice beautiful. color, too. Yeah. So, why don't we put that in the trug? There's more? And then all of this will be harvested <laughs> within the next two weeks. So, that's a busy job for the wonderful. children, not me. And over here, these are all the dried flowers that are just starting. We put these in, these two beds. So these are special flowers you grow for right. drying in here. Mm-hmm. You've got a lot of grays down in here. Yeah. I don't recognize this one right here. Well, that's a sagebrush artemisia. So it's in the wormwood family. Yes. What do you do with this one? Well, all of these artemisias, there are about four artemisias here, and all of them I would use in dried arrangements, or I would use them in wreaths. And I can't get enough of it, obviously, when you see the long row here. And each year I, I put a new um, well, garden Well, show me in how you would cut this, how much of it you would take. I wait till the seed head gets formed more, yeah. else it will just droop on you. And I take it all the way down. And then oh, I just strip sure. this part, and then I put them upside down. If I want them to have more rhythm to them, I will bend them a little bit before I put them in, because, you know, a lot of times they're just very straight. And you, and you want them to look like, real. Like, you don't want right. them to look, right. you know, like they don't belong there. So that's that. This is more of the dried flowers. So this big old field in here is also full of flowers. For yes. Drying. That looks like really fertile soil. It is good soil. They, for years, they've had been working the soil here. Even during the war, in the 1940s, they raised a detalus here. And so the whole Did field fox was foxglove. For uh, pharmaceutical That's purposes. right, when we were cut off from Europe. And so I feel like it's been well worked, and I'm lucky to live here. You know, with your old, old home, I guess that this land has been in cultivation yes. for many, many generations. And look at here. This is a scare lady down here? Yes, this is Daphne. Daphne the scare lady. <laughs> and hopefully <laughs> she's going to keep the crows. Who decorated well, Daphne? Did. And my friend Mary Milligan, who's my herb mentor. And they decorated Daphne. She even has a precious rose there, and she has chive blossoms and yarrow. So Polly and Diantha. Abigail, your little girls, worked on this, yes, too. Yes, and my father, everybody. It's a group effort. Uh -huh. We're hoping it's going to keep the crows away. And over here, Jim, are all the dried flowers, the lemon verbena, the safflower, calendula, amobium. So you grow them to a certain stage and then cut yes. them for drying. Uh -huh. And here are some more of the teasel. This is a wonderful old one. They used to use this to card wool long ago in New England in the early years. So it was like a comb. They drew it yes. through the wool. Yes. Uh -huh. And this has a wonderful brown seed head that late in uh, September that I would dry. Very tall. This will get about seven feet tall. And that's really a wildflower. So you have, so far, you've got perennials and you've got herbs and you've got wildflowers. Oh, well, seasoned here, aren't we? <laughs> One of my favorite basils, cinnamon basil. Oh, I know this little fella. I'm sure mm -hmm. you do. You grow lots of basils yourself. Yeah, I, I love them. Now, you have a licorice basil that I haven't used, but mm -hmm. this is wonderful in arrangements. I make a cinnamon basil vinegar. It's I dry really it in the cinnamon. drying room. Oh, well, that's one thing you know about people who love herbs. They swap. Oh. Well, I'll trade you. How about that? Good. Now, I got this one at home, too, but it's only half that large. This is... Well, you have to come to New England, Jim. We call it walking onions. Yes, what do you well, we call, call it? it Egyptian onion or top onion. Well, what do you use it for? Well, I use it for decorative that goes in the barn, and then I will snip one, and I'll fill it with a cream cheese or... A, this hollow stem. Yes, a hollow stem, and then I'll just slice it. If you were doing slices like that, and then you would just eat it. And you put fill cheese it in with... it. Yes, your favorite <laughs> dip or whatever. Let me, let me see that. Top onion. Nice, nice. And the nice scented marigolds we use in now, potpourri. This one? Mm-hmm. A, a scented marigold. A scented marigold. Some pigment. marigolds don't smell. Yeah, and it's worth wonderful. The and uh, it hasn't been very popular around here until maybe the last four or five years. Now, what do you what do you pick from this? I pick the blossom and I pick the leaf. A little bit of the leaves yep. as well. And this needs to be harvested. All this yarrow. So why don't we get in here? This is yarrow moonshine. I prefer it to coronation gold. Coronation gold is a much more yellow. This is a this dries much. And this is one of the Achilles. Yeah, and it dries yarrow. a very uh -huh. ice lemon. Really nice. Let's and you can, that. if you forget to harvest this, uh, and it gets a little bit brown on you, is it all right? Yes, here? I pick it in gradations so that I have beige and brown. The other thing you have to be careful though is you don't cut the whole thing down because for photosynthesis. 
you really need enough to oh, have it growing. Oh, leave enough of the right, uh, of the leaves so that the plant can right. support itself. Yeah, I see. Okay. Well, I see Polly and Abigail over I there know. gathering roses. I have. I have them busy. We only have a few weeks with the roses, and we love them. They make wonderful potpourri, and they put them in wreaths. And we, this is all the fragrant old roses. These are your busy little elves. Yes. There Are these um, uh, old-fashioned roses? Yes. This yes. looks like the fairy. Yes, it is the fairy okay. rose. Isn't that lovely? It's pretty blossoms, and, and Paul is, gets them in bud, and she gets them when they're full out. And we, if they're not in the perfect order, we use them for potpourri, and then we'll dry some of them in silica gel. What's the old one that's so doubled up in cabbage-y? Well, this is head? Paul Navron. Oh, yeah. And this is Konikan von Denmark, which I, I love. So Very then they're fragrant. special roses. If you're going to harvest them for potpourri... If you're going to use them for potpourri, you have to have some fragrance unless you add oils. But we like to be more natural. Uh-huh. This is a nice drying rack that my father, if you can see, gave it to Polly in Christmas 1983. Wonderful. And he designed Wonderful. it. And Abigail uses it, too. <laughs> you're lucky to have those little helpers well, this there. This one's to... not so little anymore, Jim. She's taller than I am. <laughs> well, here's a big clump of lilacs. Uh, are these useful in your well, flower Well, I can use them for potpourri. I, didn't, I don't always use them every year, but you can. And they're certainly fragrant to use. You know, sadly, we can't grow them very well where I live down south. I know. I, um, I ship them to my mother <laughs> in the springtime. They have to have a dormant. Federal Express. They have to have a dormant uh, period. And well, Jim, this is hops. This. this is hops. Uh-huh. And what we like collect... Like beer hops. Right. And what we like to use are the strobles, which get to be a beautiful yellow. So the flower... That. The flower and seed heads uh, turn yellow. That's what we use yellow. it in for arrangements. Much later ways. in the year. Then. Yes, that would be in September. Well, what is this? Well, we found this old soap, soap, soapstone sink in the greenhouse, and so we decided to put out here, and my dad gave us some water, and so we're using it out here just for the plants, so I can water and right this in is a This is an ivy-leaved geranium, but it yes. sure makes a good touch there. Oh, well, thank you. And more stonework around here. And I see we're sort of getting into the shade, but you got a little pocket right. of sunlight here that's just right for this yes, kind of Yeah, I have enough yarrow. sun for these German hybrids. Beautiful the, yarrow. This is the other color kind of... of and this will dry activity. a little deeper color, and there's a pink variety. They're lovely. There's lots of yarrows that you can use in drying. Mm -hmm. They're very effective in arrangements. Baptisia I use. I use the pods. This one blossoms. Is this Baptisia. the blue one or the yes, yellow one? Yes, this is the blue one. You see the pod? Oh, it's like, just starting, but it turns yeah. a beautiful gray like, black. Like bladders. Yeah, it's very mm -hmm. nice. They Great. rattle, I think, when they dry. Uh huh. And this is the hosta garden. I think hostas have been kind of uh, gotten a bad rap. I think. I think they're beautiful. I use the seed heads for arrangements. I think there's a lot of texture to them. There's you know, different colors, the gradations. I, I think it was that the people got tired of the old yeah. varieties and they don't realize how well, much I really is happening enjoy them. with them now. They're really My favorite beautiful. is uh, Francis Williams. You want Hang to see on a minute before Williams? we go see Francis. Look, ah, the tell bench. me about this. You want to sit down? <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> My father made the bench. And it's, we love it. And it's wonderful. And when we get really tired, we sit out here and we can look at the garden. And view it, the garden from uh, here. That I know wood and that's solid oak. That, solid oak. That man's an artist. <laughs> He's a nice father. So in your hostas, you use the uh, blossoms? Yes. In fact, uh, I'll pick one down and you, here. Uh, and the seed pods mm -hmm. as well. And this is my favorite. This is Frances Williams. This is Frances Williams. And her daughter, who is 80 years old now, is one of my good friends, and gave me all of these hostas to start my, my so hosta garden. So gardeners beget gardeners, right. and it just goes on okay. and on. These aren't quite ready, but I just want to show you how beautiful that oh, is. Oh, that's That's marvelous. hosta marvelous. pie crust. Pie crust. Uh -huh. Named for the... Um, sort of seersucker-like leaves. Right. Well, what's going on over here? Well, is this, this is, a shingled building part of your total operation? Yes. This is the drying room. And this is where we harvest everything and bring it into here and do our fun enjoyment for crafts and our work. Was this old barn here when you came? Yes. We were fortunate that in this old barn are drying ovens that we can harvest all of these herbs in. And if you'll come in here, you can see it. Smells them. great in here. Ah. And here are the ovens. We have four sets of these, two on the other side and two on this side. And the girls have brought the roses in, and they put them on here, and they lay them on the screens. And then depending on the weather and how much circulation we have, they dry in maybe four to five days. But you can direct fans up through here to help you in yes. the drying. But now I understand uh, darkness is important in drying, yes. too. And so these are open today, but we have shades that will go down here and over mm -hmm. in the other window, because obviously the herbs need... A good circulation, but they do, they, if you have the sun there, they're going to get faded. 
Well, you just got loads and loads of these um, dried herbs, dried flowers. What do you do with all of this? Well, the girls, are, we make herb wreaths, we make herb swags, mm -hmm. and floral decorations. And I'm involved with the Herb Society of America, and we um, have a sale once a year where we make things for that. And we have, I've tried some topiaries, and obviously the potpourri. Yeah. And we just enjoy herbs in general. Well, it's obvious you're enjoying your hobby. You need any hired help? Sure. You want to come? <laughs> Maybe an afternoon. Oh, I don't that'd be great. <laughs> that'd be wonderful. It was a pleasure having you, Jim. Well, I want to thank you so much for letting us come. And Polly and Abby, thank you so much for your help, too. Well, enjoy your trip back, and I'll send you some lilacs in the spring. That's a deal. I could tell you enjoyed that visit, Jim. And thanks to Maureen and her family for inviting us in. Roger Swain has a long list of things to tend to at the Suburban Garden, including picking raspberries for Marion's recipe. Let's see how he's doing. The first thing that any visitor to the Suburban Garden sees is this bed of annuals, and it's hard to miss. The fireworks and brass bands and beach towels all rolled into one. The nice thing about annuals, unlike perennials, where individual plants bloom for maybe three weeks and then stop blooming altogether and you have to figure out what comes in next. With annuals, you've got plants that go on blooming week after week, month after month until frost, or after frost for that matter in some cases. And if you put a good mulch, grass clippings underneath, you really don't have to do much weeding, a little water, and look what you've got. Here's a New Guinea impatiens, a huge flower. It's called Tango. It's an All-America selection. Or how about this? Marigold, that hard to imagine a bigger head of color, and this is going to go on week after week. Here's an old standby, a bright red geranium. But how about this blue ageratum? We're so familiar with ageratums that are six or eight inches high, little stubby balls of blue. Here's a plant that's 18 or 24 inches high. It's called Blue Horizons, and I think it's a wonderful improvement. You don't have to use the old standbys, of course. Here's a gumfrina. It's not the usual color, which is white or pink or mauve. This is a new tone, the bright orange red called Strawberry Fields. And I'm a big fan of this Dreamland series of zinnias. Here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven flowers open at once on a stocky, robust, healthy plant. Now, most annuals like full sun. But if you've got a shady corner, put a white flower in, like that white petunia on the right or on the left, a white impatience really lights up a dark corner, brings a little excitement to the back edge of the border. Just because annuals are old-fashioned or you see a lot of them in gas stations, places like that, don't turn your nose up at them. It's really a wonderful addition to any garden, but come on into the vegetables. When I was a child, I had an aunt who sent me $10 every spring to buy vegetable seeds with. She said, use the extra money to buy flowers because she believed that every vegetable garden ought to have a few flowers in it. And you know, I've come to agree with her. Look what just three nasturtium plants can do in a garden. Back here, I've actually got a small stand of zinnias for cutting where nobody will mind that I've pinched some blooms for the house. And here's an alcove where I put in some window boxes and a few flowers in containers. And more recently, I've excavated a patch in the bricks and put in a five-leafed akebia, which is craning up over this trellis, and a little fountain with recirculating water, a nice place to float an assortment of daylilies every morning. And these will last until evening, and I can replace them tomorrow. Just because we live here in the cool north of New England isn't any reason to deprive ourselves of some southern vegetables. I mean, how about this okra, Jim Wilson? That's not bad, is it? We may not be able to grow sweet potatoes the way you can, but we're going to get some nice roots off those plants. Now, here's something that most of my friends in New England would never recognize. It looks too much like sweet corn, but it's actually sweet sorghum, an African plant, one of the oldest cultivated crops. And the stem contains sugar like sugar cane. You can eat it fresh or squeeze out the juice and boil it down and make a sorghum syrup for your pancakes. Onions are off to a real nice start. These red ones are beginning to bulb up nicely. The sign that an onion is mature is when the top falls over by itself. If you look at the Stuttgart in the middle row here, you'll see they're falling over. And 
I'm going to let them dry up a bit before I pull them for storage, but I can pick one now and show you. Isn't that a nice bulb? Now, the same goes true for potatoes. When their tops begin to brown and die down, well, that means it's time to dig them, too. Now, let's see what we can find down under here. Just take a spading fork and work back from the edge so you don't spear any tubers. Now, there's. Now, this is a variety called fingerlink. And we're growing it for its flavor, not, not the total tonnage. It's a real nice handful. But come on, Marion's asked me to get some raspberries. Well, as we're going by, let me show you, let me show you these beans. This is a new pole bean called Fortex. Look how long and slender that is. And, and this is the right time to pick pole beans when they're still pencil thin, when they're tender enough to eat raw. Mm, boy, that's good. And the tomatoes are off to a nice start. They're beginning to color up good. They really will be vine ripened in just a few days. And hooey, look at this fennel. Boy, isn't that a nice plant. This is anise flavored. Member of the carrot family. Not many people grow up. It's awful easy to grow, and that's as handsome a specimen as I've seen in some time. Getting to be time to hill up the leeks again every time I turn around. Time to do it again. Just a matter of pulling in a little soil up around the leaf bases just to blanch the lower ends of these plants. But all right, I really, I really should get to those raspberries. Raspberries are the, probably the easiest of all fruit crops to grow, but that's not to say they're without problems altogether. A lot of you may have seen in your raspberry patch this time of year new shoots that are mysteriously wilting at the ends. And if you look a little farther down the stem, you'll see the source of the problem, a pair or one or two dark lines. And this is caused by the raspberry cane borer or beetle that girdled the stem twice and laid an egg in the middle. The treatment is just to take your pen knife and cut that off and get it out of the garden. And if you keep after them, you'll eventually cut the problem way down. The secret to picking raspberries is to use a small container. If you stack them too deeply, they'll crush each other. And look for fruit that is really a good deep red and pulls off easily. When you take them into the house, don't wash them. Wet raspberries will mold almost instantly. Instead, chill them down to 45 degrees as soon as you can and they'll keep for several days. I couldn't resist eating just a few fresh, but I hope that's enough for you, Marion. Raspberries mm, are a sensational compliment to a wonderfully sinful dessert, creme brulee. Creme brulee is a smooth as silk custard with a crunchy caramel topping. And the best part about it is they can make it way ahead. I've begun by heating some cream, two cups of heavy cream, and two cups of half and half, and I'm going to add a little bit of vanilla, about a teaspoon, and let that sit while I mix together my egg yolks. I've got eight egg yolks. I'm going to start to beat those and add a half a cup of super fine sugar, and I'm going to let that beat until the mixture becomes a pale yellow and thickens. Now, with the eggs and sugar beaten up, I want to add the hot cream. First, I'm going to add a tiny bit of cinnamon, about a quarter of a teaspoon, and a pinch of salt. And then the cream I'm going to add very, very slowly, because I don't want those eggs to scramble. This is the dish that the custard will bake in. And it's very important that the dish that you choose can tolerate the heat of the oven, go to the cold of the refrigerator, and come back to the superheat of a broiler. That just fills the dish, and then that goes in to a baking pan. And the reason for that is I'm going to pour hot water all around this dish so that it comes up to about halfway up the sides. And that's going to protect the custard as it cooks. It will give it a gentle bake. And my oven is set for 350 degrees. And in goes the whole thing, and that will bake for about an hour and 10 minutes. I'll check it after an hour with a toothpick and see if the custard is firm.
Okay, let's see how we're doing. Oh, that looks beautiful and gold. It's just shivering a little bit. And let's see, a toothpick goes in, and it's not dripping, so that means that custard is done. Now, this is going to come out, and I'm going to let it cool a little bit, and then it will go into the refrigerator and chill thoroughly for six to seven hours. Now, the creme brulee is going to be decorated with a little raspberry sauce. So I have pureed about a cup and a half of raspberries, and I want to get rid of all the seeds. So the best way to do that is to put them in a strainer and then just press until all the pulp and juices go through. What a beautiful color this is. I'm going to add just a little bit of flavoring. Half a lemon, that's about a tablespoon of lemon juice. And a little sugar to taste, maybe a tablespoon, tablespoon and a half. And then I can set this aside. Well, now the custard served its time in the refrigerator, and it's back in its original baking pan, but this time it's surrounded by ice. I've sifted over a little bit of brown sugar, and now it's going to go under the broiler. The ice is going to protect the custard and keep it cold while the top gets nice and brown. And I'm going to watch this carefully. I want it to brown, not burn. Okay, look at how quickly that is. That's about 30 seconds, and it's nice and brown. And now I'm going to give it one more sifting of brown sugar. This is going to make a really nice double crunchy layer of caramel on top of this custard. And it's going to go back in and brown quickly one more time. There, a caramel topping. Back in the refrigerator for one more hour and it's ready to serve. Creme brulee all by itself is awfully good and raspberries alone are delicious. But put them together, and you've got a dessert that's absolutely irresistible. Oh, boy, that was great, Marion. I hope there's some left for me. Well, thanks for being part of our program today. And please do come back next time to meet the first two finalists in our window box contest. Until then, this is Bob Thompson from the Victory Garden. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television stations. And by Monrovia Nursery Company, major producer of container-grown plants, supplying garden centers and nurseries nationwide. By the American Rental Association, 3,500 members nationwide, renting tools and equipment for home, gardening, and entertaining needs. And by W.R. Grace, makers of Peter's professional concentrated liquid plant food for all home gardening needs, indoors and out. Now, home improvement is easy with helpful hints from Dean Johnson and Joanne Liebler. Useful decorating tips to advice for the dedicated do-it-yourselfers. Spend some time with the hosts of Home Time, next on KCPT.